glad that you're here. We're going to open up God's Word together. And today I'm going to talk to you about Shake It Off. As I was preparing this sermon, I had this annoying Taylor Swift song going through my head, and I completely regretted choosing that title. But as, as we go this, here's what I want you to do. I want you to think about something. And I was thinking about this as the other day, somebody came to me and said, well, like, what have you guys preached about during this time? And we, first of all, you remember we did Lessons in Lockdown. And it was a great series, longest series we've ever done in church. And we talked about patience and joy and learning to work through all the things that we struggle through. And then our next major series was jailbreak. Forget about all this stuff. We just want to get out of here. This is ridiculous. This has gone on way too long. It's killing me. And, and <laughs> well, maybe not quite, but it's, there, there's, a, there's an interesting progression there, isn't there? That we're kind of in that place. And, and I want to spend the next little while talking to you about something that I think is incredibly important for us is as as I was walking around, I saw the pools were open and the kids were all full. The, the uh, sports uh, fields had stuff in it and we've reached all of our vaccine targets. So we're in this place where we're opening up. And I want to encourage you in something that I think is incredibly important for us. And that is this, that we are not just in that place where we restart, but we actually need to reset that there are some things that God has been doing in your life all through this pandemic that he's been working on because you know the Holy Spirit's at work in your life all the time, whether you realize it or not. And it would be an entire colossal waste if you went back to exactly the same place that you were. Now, I know this. I have that feeling. You know what I want to do? I want to have one big mask burning party when this is all done. In fact, I'm inviting all of you over to Isaac Buchert's place. The whole church can come over to Isaac Buchert's place and have one big mask burning. Larissa is going to make watermelon and roll kuchen, and it's going to be fantastic. And we're going to do this. And, we're going to and then we would like to have it all go back to normal, right? And we can go to a bomber game and we can yell at the ref and we can, you know, to the, to the BC Lion fans. I never make fun of Toronto Argo fans. You know why? Because they already have the Leafs and how much can one bear? <laughs> You're welcome, Pastor Steve. He's one of those people. Hey, so we're going to talk about what does it mean to not restart, but reset. And I, I think there's some incredibly important things that we look at because we would like to have it all come back to the same way. But you know what? Here's the thing. You've changed. And so have I. And your church has changed. And your church has changed in a lot of ways. We've already decided, guys, that we're going to be kind of like a hybrid church. We're going to do online stuff and we're going to do in person. We are so looking forward to you being in person. Like it's going to be like one big group hug. Unless you're an introvert, then you can look at a distance and smile and nod. Right? We're good. But we're, we're, we're already decided. Uh, there are things that we have done and changed about how we're going to do things. We're not going to go back to that same place because we've changed. Our church has changed. I think if, if we're really honest, we look at some of the things that have happened and even the dynamics. I've talked to a lot of family members and they've said, you know, we are not as unified as we were. Like we fought over masks and vaccines and lockdowns. And when all of that stuff is gone... We're, we, we got some fixing to do because we're going to have to think about what's really important about the gospel and about family and about relationships because all of that stuff is going to be gone. And what's really important, what matters? And this is one of the challenges that I think without, a lot of people have said they're of low energy and purposeless and not terribly motivated. I had one administrative person said, you know, I am a ducks in the row person. I have no ducks. <laughs> Somebody give me ducks so I can line them up and make it happen. And another single person says, you know what, I'm, I don't know if I'll ever go on another date again. And he, he stopped for a while and said, I'm not sure I even want to go on a date again. Ah! Right? I mean, so many things have changed in our life. And as we go, we're not going to say, okay, we're just going to go back to that. Because God has something for us. And here's the word that I want to use for us over the next few weeks. Is that God has an upgrade for you. Are you ready to receive an upgrade? Who does not like upgrades? Oh, we go in coach. Or you can go in first class. No, I'll stay in coach. 
right? Let me get you this suite, except you have this little one bedroom. Let me get me the whole suite. There are upgrades that God has for you. And if you are just thinking physical things or a new boyfriend or whatever, that's probably not where you should be going. Well, maybe the new boyfriend, who knows, right? Might be a better one out there. But it, what we're really looking at is that God has some things that he has been working on throughout this whole pandemic. And he has been doing stuff in you. He's been growing things in you. And now what he does not want you to do is go back to the same old, same old. That would be a, such a huge mistake. And actually, there's a couple of places in scripture that I want to grab a hold of. And I want you to think about this. The whole children of Israel, there are two watershed events in the life of Israel, in the God's people. And one was when Moses took them to, out to the promised land and they had to make some change. And, and we're going to talk about that. And the other one is when they had the Babylonian exile and they were in Babylon for 70 years and then they came out again. And in both of those times, we see people who kind of were in captivity and they couldn't do anything and their rights were all taken away. And then they came back into this freedom and they had to make some decisions and think a certain way. So I think it's going to be helpful for us as we think about that and see what that is all about. So here I want to explain it to you in more of a like a Church of the Rock way. So a pirate walks into a bar. And uh, he has a wooden leg, an eye patch, and a hook for a hand. And the bartender says, well, how did you get, like, the wooden leg? He says, you know what? It was a terrible day at sea, and I stood bravely against the cannons, and they blew my leg off. The bartender says, okay, what about the hook? He says, oh, yeah, I was fighting against the English, and they, they wrapped me and took me in the mask, and I gnawed my arm off, and uh, therefore I had to get the hook. And the guy said, okay, I'm not actually buying that part so much. And he says, well, what about the eye? He says, oh, it was even the worst day of my life. My crew went mutiny on me. They dumped me off on a desert island. And as I was laying there, a bird pooped in my eye. And he says, oh, come on, you don't get that from bird muck. He says, yep, it was my first day with my new hook. <laughs> it's an oldie but a goodie, right? You see, change <laughs> and adjusting to change, there was actually a point, is, is really significant and it's hard for us to do. We would love to go back to that old way, but you know what, guys? That actually doesn't work anymore. We're in a new place and God's doing new things in your life. He's built new stuff into you. you whether you're aware of it or not, God is constantly at work. He has built new things into you and they're not going to work in the old ways. And so he has some new things. And uh, Paul is talking about to the Galatians and he, when he really begins this whole process and, and he starts us off with that. But I'd like you to look at, at three different ways that we're going to do this and we'll jump into Galatians. There are three ways that you get your upgrade. And that's embrace the lessons that we've learned, evaluate we, what we want to carry on with, and engage slowly. So there are three ways that you can do. In, in Gal Paul was writing to the Galatians and they had come through this whole period of time and then they were reverting back to the old. And because he was their father, he could kind of talk to them like a father would talk to them. And in Galatians 3, verse 4, I'll, I'll just take the one verse. This is what he says. Have you gone through all of this for nothing? Is it really all for nothing? And I want you to think about the pandemic. Have we gone through all of this for nothing? It kind of feels like it, doesn't it? Ah, I just want to survive. No. It, maybe if you're not a follower of Jesus, you could say that. But if you are a follower of Jesus, that is not true. There is something that God is doing. In the message, it says this. Did you go through this whole painful learning process for nothing? But it's not yet a total loss because it certainly, but it certainly will be if you keep up in your old ways. There is a way that God wants to move you forward. And it, we can kind of look at COVID as, as kind of one big timeout where we could look and say, okay, what is it that we need to learn and grow in so we can become what God wants us to be so we can get that upgrade in our life. There's, um, you know, I, I was thinking about kind of big picture on this. I don't know if you ever watched the old movies and there, there was this one movie, Mad Max, and they had the in the future and it was like chaos and they were fighting over oil, right? That was the big thing. If you know, it doesn't matter if you don't know the old movie. And I realized that, you know, they couldn't possibly know the future because now we realize what are we really going to fight over when things go really bad? 
toilet paper. And they're gonna make a movie of this. This is like the worst dad joke ever. And you know what they're gonna call it? Game of Thrones. <laughs> Why do you guys know that show? None of you should be watching that. Just kidding. So here we go, Galatians 3 verse 4. What is it that we wanna do? What lessons do we want to embrace? And, and I'm gonna give you one little piece, but here's what I'm gonna get you to do. You need to think about this yourself because your lessons that God worked out in you are actually yours. And, and there are, are three ways that you're gonna do this and you're gonna see this popping up over time. It's the word of God, the people of God, and the spirit of God. There are three lights that you have that, that can help you to do this. And so as you think about these things, you're gonna have the ability to say, okay, what is it in my life that I, are the lessons that God has been teaching me? And you can talk to the people around you, you can take time to be quiet and ask the Holy Spirit. Uh, you can look into scripture and some of the, the verses that are jumping out at you as you're reading the Bible, those are actually going to be tied to the thing that God is teaching you. Do you know why? Because the Holy Spirit is brilliant. He is working in your life all the time and whether you know it or not, there are some lessons that he has taught you and is teaching you. Now what you need to do in this season is begin to embrace those lessons. And I think one of the big ones, and I'm gonna take just a minute to do this, is I think God's been teaching us all about where our hope is and what our hope looks like. Because I think our hope was too small and it was tied to too many things that are right here and right now. I really hope, and this isn't bad, in the promises of God for the present, right? I would like things to work out. I would like my family to be great. I'd like my paycheck to be good. I'd like my job to be this. I'd like to be married. All of those things are in the present. And we've kind of got to see our hope as this one dimensional thing. But God's hope is actually a whole bunch of different dimensions. And more than that, it kind of transcends all of everything. It's a big hope. And, and I think once we got everything taken away from us, all of a sudden we, we, got to, we could have, if we would have been thoughtful, realized, wow, I was putting my hope in a bunch of things that, I, that are nothing. <sighs> there's, there's nothing there. There is no hope in my paycheck. I'm putting my hope in the government. Oh my. Right? I'm gonna put my hope in science. Well, what is science? Like this science, that science, who's science? YouTube science, Facebook science, oh my gosh, right? And all of a sudden you begin to put, you, you find shaky ground. And you know what? I think it's great that we got our ground shaken because where's your hope? Is your hope just in that one dimension of what's gonna happen right now? Does God bless you right now? Let's answer that question. Those who are here, does God bless you? Yes, thank you. God blesses you, but is that the place that you, is that the single dimension that you put your hope on? I want to read some verses that I, I think are incredibly helpful for us because it gives that many-sided hope that I think we've been forced to think about. And I think it's one of those things that I've learned personally and has been a real challenge. And that's from Revelation 21, 1 to 6. And uh, the whole idea of hope, guys, is, is really this. Hope is something that, that we have to kind of really grab a hold of. And that's the sense of that I want to get this whole piece to expect that in the future that will help you handle the present. Hope is what you expect in the future that will help you handle the present. Does that make sense? What you expect in the future, that's what helps you handle the present. So what do you expect in the future? If you're expecting the government to take care of you, if you're expecting your job, if you're expecting all of those things, and all of a sudden they've been pulled away from you, that means your hope has not been, it has been only one dimensional. Here, let's take a look at, at those verses from Revelation chapter 21. It says, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, future. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea, and I saw the holy city, a new Jerusalem coming down from heaven. So we get this whole brand new thing prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. Now I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, the dwelling place from God is among the people and he will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them and he will be their God. 
And these are sort of the, the familiar verses, the ones that are really famous. He will wipe every tear from our eyes and there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. And he says, he who is seated on the throne says, I make every, I am making everything new. Write these things down. These words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, it is done. I am the alpha and the omega, the beginning, the beginning and the end to the thirsty. I will give water without cost from the springs of living life. So here's what I want you to think about. In those verses, there was a whole bunch of dimensions of hope. Something in the future that helps us work through what we have in the present that I want you to think about. Because if, you, if your hope is too small, if it's not deep enough, if it's not eternal enough, I think we learned in this pandemic, we, we flounder, right? Because we have nothing to grab a hold of. We have a hope that we have a good end, that we're actually going somewhere, that it isn't the circle of life. Timon and Pumbaa, right? It isn't all of that kind of stuff where, you know, the, the predator eats the prey and he gets down and he turns into poop, which goes poop in the grass and the grass grows up and the prey. That's supposed to be, in, like, it's a quaint little Disney song. Thank you for singing that. That's supposed to be every other religion. You know this, right? Every other religion says there's some sort of circle. You know what God says? He's going to take the absolute best things of who you are that he created, and they're never going to end because you have eternal life right now. And that is going to keep going. You are not poop. How encouraging is this? Sometimes you feel like it. I guess that sometimes you act like it. But God says, I am going to take those eternal things of who you are. Christianity is the only place where God says, I, t I made you, I take you, and that the best part of who you are, I made it because you are made in the image of God and you are going to live forever. And it's going to be even more perfect. I'm thinking, oh, that is a great hope. But that's just one dimension. There's a whole, a whole bunch of different dimensions that we can see. We have a hope that's a love, about a love that's complete. You and I, I think whether we see it or not, understand that relationships are probably the most important thing that we have. I'd like you to think about the best things that have happened in your life and the worst things that have happened in your life. And I bet you almost all of them are connected to relationships. When my kids were born, when I was married, the good times that I've had with friends, all of those things are the best times that we have. And, and what, what God says is that, that he is going to have a city that he is going to make where all of us, where our love is complete, where, where we aren't annoyed by people anymore. Dwayne. How is this possible that we won't annoy each other? Like it's somehow in heaven, God. <laughs> Anyways, somehow in heaven, God's going to redeem that. And those relationships, that part is the best. Now, now, get back to that. What are the best things that you've experienced in your life? I bet you every one of those things involves a person and that genuineness of being known and somebody knowing. The thing you're most afraid of, the thing you're unsure about, is the best stuff in your life. And, and it's, it's what God has for you. It's, the, it's seeing your grandkids. It's the good times that you had with friends. It's eating. It's When I think back to my family, it's, it's having night lunch, which is a Mennonite thing that you have with all of your people and you sit down and you laugh and you talk together. That's what I remember about my childhood. It's the best stuff. Now, the, the other side is the worst stuff is probably when someone's struggling or someone close to you is sick or somebody dies or you've had things not work out or you've watched somebody struggle. I've had this in my life where I've watched people who I love struggle and there is nothing that I could do for them. And it just breaks my heart. I'm thinking, God, how come I can help so many other people? Or maybe I can't help them. And you just watch people you love struggle. It's so painful. Do you know why? Because relationships are what is matters. And that's the eternal part that lives. But it lives in perfection. Um, over this COVID series, uh, season, uh, one of my best friends from a, a former church died of COVID. And uh, I, I just... 
you know, I knew he was in the hospital. I knew he had COVID. Lots of people have got COVID, right? It's like, how many, we see the updates all the time on the board. And, and Pete died. Going, oh. I remember back to him and I cutting wood so we could keep our houses warm and our kids, we grew up in the same yard. We had a little commune going and, uh, you know, we, we babysit each other's kids and, and they grew up together. And then I saw uh, his two kids doing this stupid online funeral, right? And they were just, his daughter got up and she just started to cry and she says, I just want to go in the bathroom and hide and pretend the dad's going to come back again. And all I wanted to do was to be there and to give her that hug. Because the best things and the worst things, the things that are real value, are relationships. And God says that when you and I get that new heaven and that new earth, that there's going to be this perfect affected relationship that we have, not just with the people who are closest to us, but I mean, this is sort of mind blowing, right? Everybody. And again, caveat to the introverts, it'll be perfect. You won't have to get too close, right? God will work it out. In all of this, God is saying, I want you to have a hope that has a whole bunch of different dimensions. I want you to have a hope that is greater and fuller. The, the other part that we see in this scripture is it says that he prepares us as a bride and the Lord relates to us as a spouse relates to the other. There's, I remember there's a, a lady who I know really well and she came to me and says, you know what? I have to work through something and that's this, is my husband always used to say I was gorgeous and today he said I was cute. <laughs> Apparently I have to settle for cute. Now being a man, I'm thinking, I don't get any of this, actually. <laughs> it seemed like a compliment to me. Like, what do you want, lady? I didn't say that, because over 30 years of pastoring, I've gotten a little bit wiser. I said, oh, okay. She says, you know what, Aubrey? He says, every woman wants to be gorgeous to their husband. I said, oh, hey, guys, you know what? You know what this text says? God the creator of the universe who made everything incredibly beautiful says, you are gorgeous. <laughs> Some of you are looking going, really? Yes. He says, there's going to come a time when he's going to make it. And not only that, the Holy Spirit is working right now inside of you to make you beautiful. You are struggle with the things that we struggle with and we do anything and God says, no, let me give you a picture because there's a future thing that I want to get, that I want you to get so you can deal with the present. He says, I want you to know that your God is going to look at you and he's going to say, man, you are gorgeous. Inside, outside, all the way through. I made you and you're Amazing. Kind of puts a different perspective on the little things that we struggle with, right? Our hope has a whole bunch of different dimensions to it. Now, that's a longer version of one of the things that I think we've learned during COVID. But here's, here's what I'd like to, to kind of bring it to you. What have you learned? What are the things that God's been kind of pushing you on the word of God, the spirit of God, the people of God. I mean, you're going to see some lights coming up and this is sort of the picture that I want you to get. He wants to shine three lights into your life. And those three lights are going to be the green lights to help you understand all of these things that we're talking about. The word of God. There's some verses that are going to pop out. The people of God, the people who know you best are going to be able to help you in this. What lessons have I learned that I need to embrace in this season and the spirit of God? At the end of this message, we're going to take some time and we're just going to be quiet. And we're going to give God an opportunity with you to say, you know, God, what is it that you want me to embrace in this? What are the things that you've been teaching me? Because the last thing you want to do is try to go back to the thing that was. Because God has an upgrade for you. The second thing is this. 
and, and we're going to talk, this is more about evaluating. We're going to evaluate what you need to carry on. In, in Haggai, uh, the Bible talks about the fact that the people had come back after the exile, after the captivity, after the lockdown, and they started doing all the stuff that wasn't bringing them fulfillment. And in verse 5 to 8, it says, Now this is what the Lord Almighty says, Give thought to your ways. You've planted much, but harvested little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but you're but not warm. You earn wages only to put them in purses that have holes in it. And what he's doing is he's painting a picture. Lord Almighty, he says, give thought to your ways. He's painting a picture to say, you know what? The things that you're doing aren't fulfilling you. And, and here's what I want us to grab a hold of. If you are, if you're going to go through this whole pandemic, we're not going to waste this, right? God's at work. What are the things in your life that you've been doing and doing and doing and all of a sudden realize, you know what? I actually am getting no fulfillment from this. And I want you to take some time and pause this week with God's spirit, his people, his word, and say, what is that? Because I don't want to waste this time. And I'm going to give you just a little, a few pointers of how you can do it. There's some things you need to shake off. Um, you kind of, the, the easy one, like don't return to the rat race, right? Low hanging fruit is probably how you use social media is, is going to be one of those things that you could take a really, really good look at and evaluate to say, is that really the thing you want to do? I remember listening, one of my sons plays a particular game that he spends a lot of time on. He's a gamer and uh, he will, he showed me some of his stuff and it's sort of like one of these things where they capture with tanks and all that stuff. And one time he fell asleep playing and so I came in in the morning and uh, I hear his, his headset is laying with the computer uh, on the floor and all of a sudden I hear this, F and F, 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 and I'm thinking, what is going on? And I woke him up and I said, hey, what's that? He goes, oh yeah, they talk like that all the time. He says, being online is like soul crushing. It's like everybody talks like that to each other. And you know who's worse? The 14 year old girls. <laughs> it's an opinion. I don't know whether it's true or not. But <laughs> he says, you know what? And, he, and the, the thought that I'd like you to, to just pause a little bit to say, what are the things? And that's one example. What's your example? What are the things that you're doing in your life that over this time you realize, you know, that actually isn't building my soul. It's not actually, we only have so much time in our life. Time is the thing that's so, you can earn money, but you can ever earn back time. What's the, t what are you doing with the time that God's given you? I'm not talking that we have to all sit around and pray the whole time. That's not what I'm saying. But what is it that God has to say about your time, about how you're using it, about the priorities that you have, about the ways that you're doing it. I, I did something this year that I've never done before. This is my third time reading through the New Testament this year. And uh, I realized, wow, I could have been doing this all the time. And I got one of the little app things and I just read it and it tells me when I'm behind and when I'm ahead and I hate being behind because I'm fiercely competitive. So I just keep reading and reading and that's like, okay, then I'm good now, right? And so I get to deal with my own neurosis, which is fantastic, and read the Bible at the same time. What is it in your life? You've had some things that God wants to teach you how to learn. Now you have some things that God wants to change in your life. Do you really want to carry that forward? I think that's my question to you. What are the things in your life, if you were deadly honest, do I really want to carry that forward? Do I know that this is, is being helpful to me? Do I know that managing my time and that living my life on purpose, filling my life with stuff that doesn't matter and focusing on things that don't matter? I, there was a, a, a gentleman that I talked to and uh, I have, I believe that all, every one of our self-defeating behaviors that we do has a lie attached to it. And you've heard me say this before. And uh, he was actually, he would be somebody you'd look at in this church and you would say, he's a really good guy, had a pretty good marriage, went to church, did all this stuff. But really what he struggled with is his thought life and, and has, was not able to grab a hold of it. He struggled with, with uh, seeing women in a way that was not helpful. He would watch movies that were kind of like, eh, you know, kind of knew he shouldn't be watching them and had a whole series of things that worked up until it actually progressed to a place where he scared himself. 
where he was beginning to think about things in a way that he had never thought about them before. And then that thought came into his mind because he said, you know what, I, I'm, I actually don't want to go on with this anymore. I, I've, and it kind of got worse. And he just took some time to say this, God, what's the lie? And uh, God says, you know, here's, I'm going to give you the lie. This is kind of God's thought process to me. He says, I'm going to give you the lie, and then I'm going to give you a motivating statement. The lie is you always have to feel good all the time. And the motivating statement is this, and he'd never thought of this, because this is what sin does to us. Do you really want to do this to your wife? And as weird as that sounds, that thought has never crossed his mind because everything was in secret. And there's something that broke for that man. And he's moving on in that place. What it is in your life that you say, you know what? I don't want to carry those things forward. I'm done with it. There's, there's probably some lies that need to be broken. There's some things you do want to carry forward, right? Let's put up those three lights again. I, as you think about this, I, I, I want you to think about what, doing this. Make a don't do list. What are the things that you don't do, want to do, moving forward out of this pandemic? I got a million things on my do, to-do list. My wife's to-do list is five million things for me. <laughs> but here, here's, I, I want you to do a don't do list. The word of God, the people of God, this, you have three of those lights that are going to help you figure this out. And you're going to walk in it. The last thing is this, and this is a little bit of a how-to. And uh, if, if you saw our backstage pass, Gwen talked about this, and I want to just reaffirm what she said in this, and that is engage slowly as we move into this. Um, Habakkuk 2, 3, he, he says something that Habakkuk, the people are coming back in, and he says, at the time I've decided, my words will come true. Uh, you can trust what I can say about the future. It may take a long time, but keep on waiting, it will happen. See, there's something that is incredibly important for us. When we come into the season, we make decisions, and then our expectation is sometimes that it's all gonna change. I think if you live a while, you realize that almost nothing changes slowly, uh, uh, quickly, except especially those internal things, that this change is gonna happen slowly. So here's what I would say to you, pace yourself. Don't try to do everything all at once. Find those things that matter the most and focus on those things. Because those are the things that God has planned for you. I was thinking about this the other day. Here's some words you never hear that Jesus said. Okay, guys, we got to hurry. I'm going to quickly go and do this. Right? Right? Never, and I could, I could spend the, all those things that we do, and we say, we gotta, gotta, gotta. Jesus didn't gotta. He was not uptight. He had one thing. In fact, he said it to Mary, right? He said to Mary and Martha, he says, you know what? There's, there's, there's one thing. Pick that one thing that God wants you to do and Go. Because here's my promise to you, because I know this. God is an upgrade for you. And he's put it in your life, and he's going to work it out. So here's what I'd like us to do. Bow your heads, close your eyes. We're just going to take a, just a minute. We had the word of God, the people of God, and the spirit of God. We're going to look at those three. We're going to look at that and just say, okay, we're, spirit of God, would you come right now? And just in the quietness of this moment, what is that one thing that you, will, that you maybe want me to keep doing, you want me to embrace, maybe let go? It's your time, Holy Spirit. Would you speak to your church? Speak to us, Lord.
friends, this is just the start. You can remain in that attitude of worship. Friends, is just, this is just the start. I like giving you a few things that really encourage you this week to grab a hold of. Just keep your heads bowed, your eyes closed, whatever way you are focusing on God. And I'd like to ask you this question, and, and we do this after every service because it is the most important thing that we start with. And there's going to be a hand popping up. And if you need to make the most important decision of your life, and that's to accept Jesus, to ask him into your life, to give him leadership of your life. He said, man, I've gone through this whole thing, and I've just done the whole thing on my own, and it's gone badly. I, your upgrade, you got the biggest upgrade coming right now, and that is when Christ comes into your heart, you receive the Holy Spirit. So if that's you, if you want to make that decision to give God leadership of your life, if you want that upgrade, I want you to just push on that button right now. And just do that and receive what it is. It's God working in you. You do the small part, he does the big part. All right, if you have pushed that button, or maybe you should have, and you're... I, I, a sense of somebody, it's, it's, it's a man actually who has just said, you know, I, I'm not sure about that right now. Uh, I want you to, pr all of us, to pray this prayer. And if you will even begin by praying this prayer, sir, God's going to come in and he's going to do some amazing things in your life. So would you repeat after me? Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for Jesus. I choose to give him leadership. I thank you that you died for me. I thank you that you love me. I thank you that I have a full hope that will not disappoint. I thank you for the way you see me, you love me, and you prepare a place for me. In Jesus' name, amen. Why don't you give the Lord a hand? You can do the hand clap things online if you want to. That'd be great.